academics espouse all kinds of crazy ideas. Why should these ideas evoke such singular hostility? What is going on? Would Charles Darwin himself agree with how his theory is being defended by scientists today? I don't think so. And here's a discussion to explore that topic, and here's Darwin's book to prove it, and we're gonna look at this a little bit later. What you're about to see is a philosopher of science, an Oxford mathematician, and a professional biologist get to the heart of the problem regarding challenges to Darwin that come out of design and science itself, especially the important subject of what science is. Well, welcome to One Life Network, everyone. I'm Brett, and I've been a pastor for a long time, and at One Life, we're passionate about exploring cultural conversations from a Christ-centered worldview with people who believe and with people who don't believe. Uh, if that sounds like you, please subscribe. Uh, we'd love to have you along for the journey. Now, the conversation we're going to hear gets to the heart of so much of what we hear concerning science and religion. Now, listen closely, and on the back end, I want to give some of my own thoughts, but also include Charles Darwin's thoughts as well. Watch this. Hold Hold on. Let me just yes, Michael. Let Michael come in. Yes, absolutely. I, I feel as though I've set things up so that the two of you have been able to beat him about the head and shoulders. When, when, when Isaac Newton developed his wonderful law of gravity, uh, he was asked, what the heck is gravity? And he, and didn't he know. said, hypothesis non fingo. Yes. I feign no hypothesis. He had, I don't no, know. He had no mechanism. He didn't, he didn't have a mechanism. What's the mechanism for the Big Bang? Nobody oh, knows. No. What's the mechanism for radioactive decay? Uh, um, so there's lots of things that happen. People don't know what the mechanism is, but we see patterns and we uh, can deduce uh, explanations from the patterns. Okay. I'm going to quote you, and I begin by quoting someone you quote. This is more Behe here. Biochemist Franklin Harold in his 2001 book, The Way of the Cell, quote, we should reject as a matter of principle the substitution of intelligent design for the dialogue of chance and necessity, but we must concede that there are presently no detailed accounts of the evolution of any biochemical system, only a variety of wishful explanations, close quote. And Michael says, well, to begin with, that's quite a breathtaking concession, and congratulations, the science has moved along enough to recognize the limits to Darwin. And then Michael continues, Harold never spells out his reasoning, that is to say, why we should reject intelligent design in principle, but I think the principle probably boils down to this. Design appears to point strongly beyond nature. All three of us are down for, everybody's down for that. It has philosophical and theological implications because some think that science should avoid a theory that points so strongly beyond nature, they want to rule out intelligent design from the start, close quote. This is the question of drawing lines. And I pose the question to Michael Behe, what the heck is wrong with that? We just say, Science goes as far as it goes with our five senses and what we can reason therefrom. And when it hits a dead end, it says, dead end. Okay. Well, Haven't got it. Radioactive decay, some... gravity, don't know, don't know, don't know, don't know. Go ahead. So what's wrong with drawing these very sharp lines? Why do you want to include intelligent design in the scientific enterprise? Well, uh, uh, for a couple reasons. First, if, if si have scientists claimed that they did not know how life developed, that would be good with me, that would be a step in the right direction, because they don't. Unfortunately, people pretend that they do. On the other hand, uh, we can tell, we conclude design, we, we infer design from physical evidence. It's not from some, you know, vision or anything that people have. If you look at a mouse trap. If you look at a mousetrap, you can tell it was designed, and you can tell because you see how the parts are arranged, what the relationship of the parts with respect of each other to perform a function. When you look at a, an outboard motor on a boat, you see the same thing. You see a purposeful arrangement of parts. Now we see that in the machinery of the cell. We see outboard motors in the cell. We see trucks in right, the cell right, and, right. and so on. So, But your life would be so much easier. Yeah. If at the end of your article you but said, fun. <laughs> you said, if you would like to pursue this further, go to the Department of Philosophy, go to the go to the Department of Theology. The here, end. here the science ends. I now that's a critical thought that they're starting to talk about right here, and that's what we want to address as we go. And they're gonna they're gonna talk about it, but there's some things that we really need to look at when it comes to what science actually is. Say that 
after we conclude design. I do not infer to God. Uh, and as, as I write, some people have approached me and said, yeah, I'm with you, I think it's intelligent, but I think it's, you know, space aliens have visited us. Fred Hoyle's explanation. I, I exactly. think, Go ahead, John. I, I think the basic question here is there are several, and they're very important, is what is an explanation? That's a crucial question. And Michael cited Newton, Hypothesi non fingo, he, his gravity, when I was taught in school, I thought the law of gravity explained gravity. And I was an adult before I discovered it explains no such thing. So and I was a 59-year-old adult when I learned that. So that even a today. scientific explanation within its own terms is rarely full. It's almost never full. That's the first thing. Secondly, we get at all kinds of levels explanations in terms of agent, like if we want a complete description of the motor car. Now, your earlier question to Michael, could God have done this? There is a sense in which God can do things any way he likes. But the issue is, how does God do it? And secondly, is his activity detectable scientifically? Now, I'm putting those words together very carefully. Not is his involvement detectable, but is it detectable in terms of science? In other words, if you set up your definition of science as restricted to the five senses, yes. so that you're not, and here comes the principle, the Socratic principle, that is often violated, that the late Anthony Flew saw, that when he came to conclude that there was an intelligent designer behind the universe on the basis of DNA, and they said, oh, but you can't do that. He said, I follow the evidence where it leads. And this is the clash that arises. You can either say, well, science has come to an end. It cannot answer this question. There are very few people who want to say that. Or you say, science is limited. We must open the field to other kinds of questions, like the why questions of purpose, like teleology and all this kind of thing. And the underlying mistake that we're forced to think is that science and rationality are coextensive when they're not. And also that there. That is to say, science doesn't. Science doesn't. Do, science does not cover the full field of rationality. No, history is a right. rational discipline. Or, and so that is there are philosophy. Other kinds of sciences, and this is what my PhD was about. There's historical There's science. Historical, historical science scientific historic. reasoning, which is all about abduction, abduction, uh, inferring back to causal to, to explain causal origins. Imagine that you walk into the British Museum and you look at the Rosetta Stone, and you and someone says, "Well, how did that? How did those inscriptions come about?" If the archaeologist is governed by the, the a principle that you uh, alluded to indirectly, it's called methodological naturalism. We may only infer materialistic causes, whatever the evidence. The, the, the scientist would miss the obvious explanation. This was produced by scribes, right. by intelligent agents. There are distinctive indicators of the activity of intelligence, and therefore that allows it's us to, to infer. It's language. There, there was one, one uh, of the early uh, pioneers in the information sciences named Henry Quassler said that the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. In other words, our uniform and repeated experience affirms that there's only one type of cause that produces information. But uniform I love the way he words that. I would, if I were you, I'd go back and look at that. He words that very, very well to describe the theory behind intelligent design issues. And repeated experience is the basis of all historical scientific reasoning. So there is a, a basis in historical scientific reasoning to infer intelligent design. There's no need or reason to limit the conclusions that we can consider in that, in that branch of science because... Unless, and here's the bottom line for all of this, unless you presume a naturalistic worldview and imprison yourself well, within that's its confines. That's, the key issue. that's not fair. If the evidence leads beyond a naturalistic view, you must pursue it, correct? Why, yes, not? why but, shouldn't you? All right. yeah. But yeah. why shouldn't you? That's right. exactly yeah. what right. I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, you're closing you're yourself within a prison. All yeah. right. Um, all three of you strike me as, well, of course, you're rather argumentative, but you all three of you strike <laughs> me as, as rational men. And yet, look at the lives you lead. Steve Meyer wrote an article on the Cambrian explosion for the Proceedings of the Biological Society at the Smithsonian Institution. 
and his editor was harassed and finally left the institution. Michael Behe has evoked from his colleagues at Lehigh University, which is a great university and especially strong in the sciences, a statement on their website that Dr. Behe is entitled to express his views, but we, his colleagues in the biology department, do not view them as science. Now, again, that's, that's the point that we really want to get across, is they define it not as science. They don't disagree with what he's saying materially. They, they don't kind of go after his argument. They're actually defining it as not science. He's been disclaimed. He's been disclaimed. Why? Academics espouse all kinds of crazy ideas. Why should these ideas, why should the challenge to Darwin and the suggestion that if there's a code, there's a coder, the suggestion of an intelligent design evokes such singular hostility. What is going on? I'll start with John because I didn't give you the What is to... going on is the domination of naturalism and materialism in the academy, which is so ironical. I'm from Oxford University. Its motto, and it's been there for a long Dominus time, is Dominus mea. Illuminatio Mea. The people that founded the great universities of the world had no problem with the idea of an intelligent designer of the universe. But now somehow in the academy, anybody who espouses the idea that was the foundation of modern science in the 16th and 17th centuries, arguably as a historical thesis, is out. And that's a great place. Just kind of process what he just said. The, these, these places where the science science itself uh, got its start are, are now being, uh, are, are now redefining it in such a way that it doesn't admit the very thoughts that led to it. And so uh, that, that's, a, that's a key thought. But here, here's a, a few things I want to kind of pass along to you. Uh, hopefully you can remember this far back. Uh, first of all, um, they, uh, they said that there are theological implications or philosophical implications is one of the reasons that uh, intelligent design is not admitted. But here's the problem, is that uh, those kind of implications happen out of whatever side. If you're a natural, uh, if you're a naturalistic science uh, is your idea, you will have philosophical implications. It goes into ethics. It goes into everything else. That's why guys like Sam Harris start getting into ethics, or they they talk about free will because you can't help it. It just kind of proceeds from there. Secondly, I'm glad they pointed out that uh, there's lots of different kinds of knowledge. We uh, science is the only kind of knowledge. It's historical. Uh, we think in different categories. Uh, we think in philosophy, we think in r relationally, we think a lot of different ways. And so science is not the only way of knowing. But here's the most important thing I, I, I want to leave you with. And um, it is that Charles Darwin himself, I think, would disagree with what's being done with his theory. And, and the way I'm going to show you that is uh, this is my copy of the origin of species. And what, may, what many people, I've heard a lot of people argue about it. A whole lot of people argue about this book and have never read this book. And admittedly, uh, I understand why, because it's super boring to read. I mean, he talks a lot about pigeons, uh, but he does come to chapter six. And chapter six is called Difficulties of the Theory. And so he's kind of outlined all his thoughts, and then he starts talking about the difficulties, and he spends the rest of the book really processing these things. And the difficulties are, first of all, um, why don't you see, if, if, if everything's about frying gradations and, and slow development, why, do you see, why don't you see just a big blob of, of different kinds of animals that are very, very closely linked? Why do we see these very clear lines between species? And he gives the answer as um, extended is one of the things that works on that. Uh, he says this, uh, why or how can you produce such exquisite organs like a heart or the eyeball or something like this? He says it this way. He says, can we believe that natural selection um, on the one hand, can produce an organ as trifling importance, such as the tail of a giraffe, which serves as a fly flapper, and on the other hand, an organ so wonderful as the eye. He's presenting that as an objection. And then he goes on thirdly, he says, uh, you know, where does instinct come from? How do bees know how to build a hive? How could you possibly uh, bring up gradations of that? And then he gives other objections, and he answers those objections. But the point is this, is that... He says this, 
Uh, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Now, I'm not going to say that he's right or wrong. What I'm saying is that inside his book, he was doing science. He presented a theory, and then inside the work itself, he presented the problems. And he talks about, as you read it, he talks about how the design of the eye really bothered him a lot. He was bothered by the objections themselves. And he even says some of these objections have true weight. But what we do is we live in a culture where you can't even say that anymore. You, you can't say, you know, the thing about, you know, a, an organ like the eye or an organ like the heart or a kidney, how could that be produced by slow gradation? You're not even allowed to say that. Here's why. Because that's doing religion. That's not doing science. Whereas inside the book itself, he was presenting the problems and he viewed himself as doing science. So in other words, someone could come along now and say, you know what? He didn't even know about DNA. So why not look at his theory kind of and consider the DNA implications of that. I think he himself would admit that and go, wow, that's a big problem. But here's an answer. Here's an answer. He would at least theorize around with it. But we don't do that anymore. We say, no, nope, you're doing religion. End of story. End of discussion. There is no discussion. And I think that's tragic. And that's what's happened to the ID people. You don't even have to agree with the ID people. But the very fact that they're being pushed away as just pushing religion is goes against the very things that Charles Darwin himself was talking about. I'm going to expand your thinking around this subject. We produced a series of videos around important worldview questions, including this one. It's called, Where Did It All Come From? Hope you'll check that out. We'll see you next time.